Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Kim Drumgo, and that is a married name, and I'm surprised that I still have kept that name. Um, Brown is a lot easier to say. Um, and so, as Amy mentioned, I am a bit of a risk taker, even though I am what Myers-Briggs would consider an ISTJ. I am an introvert, but for my birthdays, I like to do risk-taking type of things. And so on a very big birthday that I had a couple of years ago, my son dared me to go skydiving with him. Um, my 25-year-old son at that time dared me to go skydiving. And he just knew that I wouldn't. He was like, oh, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. So a week before, I said, have you made the reservations? for the skydiving. And he said, are you serious? Are you gonna go? And I'm like, yes, I'm gonna go. He didn't believe that I would jump out of the plane until I jumped out of the plane. Um, and so he was right behind me. And um, so since then, for my birthdays, I try to do something that is a little different than what I've done before. Um, this last year, I did ax throwing and um, loved it. So I'm gonna continue to ax throw and I'll just make sure that no one that I'm angry with is around me at that time. So um, anywho, I am honored to be here today. I'm looking forward to um, talking with all of you about diversity, equity, and inclusion and some of the best practices that I think all of us can employ as we think about how we create an inclusive environment, how we're growing and building diversity within our own organizations, and how we can actually take a personal accountability um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making it a part of not only who we are in our companies, but in our communities as well. So I do wanna make sure that we're making that transition, not only what we do inside the walls of our companies, but how we can really increase the inclusion and diversity in the communities that we serve as well. So um, as we continue on with the presentation, I'll you know, add a little flavor about who I am and, and where I've come from and how I've gotten into this role, but um, let's go ahead and get started. I think that um, our chair-elect, um, Heather, did an amazing job talking about Geisinger this morning and um, the deep roots that our organization has in our communities and, and how it was founded and why um, Abigail Geisinger founded our hospital. But I think it's because it's, a health, it's an integrated health system. It's a health system that not only takes care of people physically, we do the research, we prepare the physicians and the nurses to be successful in the healthcare space as well as the research in, and um, the health plan, ensuring lives. And so it's that integrated health system that really drew me to central Pennsylvania. It drew me to do the work around how we can address health disparities and how we can truly see the value of the diversity that Geisinger brings to the community that we serve. And so thank you, Heather, for that great introduction of Geisinger. I don't have to go through all of these numbers because you've heard them. So thank you so much. So um, let's get into just some quick definitions around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I always like to start off presentations by level setting what the definitions are. And so we'll start with diversity. Diversity is who we are. Each and every last one of us makes up a very unique person that we present ourselves in any day. And so diversity is who we are and there are multiple dimensions of diversity. There are those things that we can see and there are the things that we can't see. And some of those are called the invisible characteristics that we each possess. It's our education background. It's our family makeup. It's our military status that we may not be able to see. It's our communication style. Those are all of the invisible elements of diversity. The things that we can see are what we see when we walk up to people. And in this day, it's not necessarily always what we think. And so diversity is who we are. It's each one of us. It's the unique characteristics that we bring to our organization. Um, inclusion is what we do with that diversity. You know, how do we make sure that we're leveraging the diversity of the people in the room to make the decisions of our organization or to make the decisions of the communities that we're in? So it's how do we leverage those voices, how we're including them. I have a mentor um, when I first started with diversity in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. 
And he would tell me that, you know, Kim, you can always tell how inclusive an organization is by looking at the people on the first floor and the people on the top floor, right? And so he was working for Disney at the time. And um, Dr. Batanzas was his name. And Dr. Batanzas was an amazing speaker. He had such a dynamic individual. And so he's telling this story and he walks into one of the Disney resorts. And as we all know, at Disney, they have these labels, they have these signs that say not only their name, but what country they're from, right? So if you've ever been on a Disney cruise or to Disney and any of the resorts, you know where people are from. So then he goes to the top floor and he's excited because he's like, look at all of this diversity. I can't wait. I can't wait. So he gets to the top floor and he sees all of the same people, same names. And that's how he started his presentation. And very quickly, Disney at that resort began changing, making changes to make sure that the people in the countries that were represented on the first floor were then represented on the top floor in in the executive suite. And so that's what we mean by inclusion, making sure that everyone is included at all levels in the organization. Last but not least is equity. It's how we are valued. Um, And we recognize that people need different things um, to be successful or to get access. And so we can't confuse equity with equality. Equality is everyone getting the same thing, right? So I use this example with my children at Christmas. They're all looking to make sure if someone got an iPad, everyone else is looking to make sure that they got an iPad. Even though they already have an iPad, they're looking to make sure that they had another iPad, right? That's equal. But I don't give everyone the same thing because they didn't need it. One of the children already had an iPad, so two got one, right? But he's making sure that he's getting equal amount (laughs) of, of, of gifts at Christmas. But really, it's about making sure that everyone has what they need to be successful. You know, one of my kids needs a math tutor. The other two did not, right? So it's making sure that we're giving people what they need to be successful. And so when we put all of this together, we ask ourselves different questions. So diversity is who is in the room. Inclusion is has everyone been heard? And then equity is who is trying to get into the room but can't. It's making sure we're providing that access. It's making sure that we're giving people what they need to be successful. All right, let's move on. So when we think about the evolution of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our country, it really began in the 1960s with the passing of the Civil Rights Act, right? And we all know about equal employment opportunity. It's making sure that individuals had equal access to education and to employment. We then move on to affirmative action, which is making sure that employers, specifically federal um, contractors, were giving people um, affir- were giving people equal opportunity to apply, and we were utilizing the talent and the resources within our communities. And then in the 1990s, we move forward and we see this word called diversity. And diversity is making sure that we're recognizing the different people in our, in our organizations, in our communities, but it's also making sure that we're taking into account, you know, working mothers, you know, black, African-American, and Latino employees who need to work, who, who were in the workspace and need, had different needs, different skills. It's also making sure that we're taking into account veterans, people with disabilities. So diversity really began to morph into really focusing on we're all different and we need to recognize that. Then we got into diversity and inclusion. Inclusion is making sure that we were including all of these different voices throughout organizations. And now we're seeing diversity, equity, and inclusion with the Me Too movement, with Black Lives Matter, equity has become even more important than it has ever been in our country. Right? So equity is not only women, people of color, it's veterans, people with disabilities, different religions, making sure that we're making space and accommodations and giving people what they need to be successful. And I'm going to pause in our presentation. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know if you have any questions. 
The evolution of DE&I at Geisinger has had an equally monumental growth, and we have done some really good work. Um, Amy mentioned that I came to Geisinger um, in September, and we've had some really good work before I came. I was so happy um, that we already had a great foundation to build upon. And so we've done great work in the LGBTQ space and in the veteran space, and we'll continue to grow and build upon that foundation. But we've done some really good work, and I'm looking forward to being a part of a team that continues to um, make sure that we're growing in this space. And so let's talk a little bit about why we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what some of those benefits are. Um, what we see is that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a great motivator for talent attraction. What we're seeing in the space is that job seekers are really looking for organizations that have a focus on diversity and inclusion. And what we're seeing is that 67% of employee of job seekers are looking for organizations that diversity and, where diversity, equity, and inclusion are significant. And they have a place in that organization. What we're also seeing is that companies that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion are 36% more likely to outperform um, you know, their competitors and to increase their profitability. We're also seeing that organizations who focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion are more likely to operationalize their innovative ideas, 76% more. And then they're also more likely to make better business decisions and see the positive impact of their performance, of their business performance. And so there are a lot of data, there's a lot of data out there that demonstrates why diversity, equity, and inclusion is good for us. It's good for the business. It's actually good for our communities because when you consider a lot of these metrics, they have a trickle-down effect to the communities that we serve. We have some more data here that demonstrates the value that we see in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically around the cultures. You know, what we see is a greater commitment and collaboration across teams. We're seeing that individuals who work or who have diverse teams and inclusive cultures, they're 1.2 times more likely to give discretionary effort. Now, I get the question around, well, what's discretionary effort? Everybody has a little bit extra that they can give to an organization, right? You can stay the extra 15 minutes. You can stay or work on the weekend just to get something done because you believe in the company. Those organizations that have inclusive cultures get extra discretionary effort from their employees. You're going to, you naturally give a little bit more. Um, what we're also seeing is that employees who work in diverse and inclusive cultures um, are 1.19 times more likely to stay. They want to stay in the organizations. They like the people that they're working with. They're exposed to different cultures. We have a good time. I'm going to stay. I'm growing in my career. I'm developing. So I'm going to stay in the organization. We also say, or see that they have 1.4 two times greater commitment to the organization. So loyalty. They're more loyal to the organ organization. And they're 1.57 times more collaborative among their teams. And so you're seeing more collaboration. And I, I get questions around, wow, diverse teams are more collaborative? Absolutely. Why is that? It's because we're talking more. You have people who think differently on your teams, and so you're going to ask them questions. You're naturally more curious about people who think differently than you than the ones who think like you. You just assume we all think alike, so we're going to keep on going. When you're on diverse teams, you question someone else's thought process, where they're from, their backgrounds. Why do you believe that? You know, and that could be seen as contentious, but it's also curious, right? And I like to say that diversity not only makes me smarter, it makes our team brighter, right? We're able to solve problems in more unique ways and in curious ways. So those are the benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for those of you who have been checking out the agenda on your phone, I'm going to pause for a second and let's do a quick polling and survey. 
So out of all of these benefits that we talked about, uh-oh, are you going to pull it up for me? Yep, oh, the poll's open. Out of all the benefits that we have, which one of the benefits would be, most, would be the greatest for your organization? And I can't see the polling. Are you going to pull that up for us? Okay, all right. So go ahead, keep asking, get on the app. For those of you who don't have the app, you can use your badge, I think, on the back of the badge to go to the app to pull up the survey. And if you don't want to do it on the app, you can call it out to me. Which of, the, which of these benefits would be the greatest for your organization? Excellent, excellent, excellent. If we have some um, Jeopardy music, we can play that too. Okay. Is it disappearing? Um, yeah, we can close it and see what we got so far. We got 40, 36% engagement, mm-hmm. 27 talent attraction, mm-hmm. 18 innovation, 9 company performance, and 9 collaboration. Okay, so engagement, right? Engagement wins? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We have another poll coming up, so if you want to spend a couple of seconds getting ready for the next poll, please do so. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk to you while you do that about our why for diversity, equity, and inclusion at Geisinger. And you know, later in our presentation, I'll be talking to you about making sure you understand your why for diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization. You know, we talked about Geisinger being one of the largest employers, healthcare providers in central northeastern Pennsylvania. And so as we continue to expand our markets, we're, ex- we're continuing to expand the diversity of the people that we serve. We recognize that the way that we care and the importance of providing culturally sensitive care is going to be important to us. It's important to the people that we serve. And so that's the second piece of why we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We recognize that in order to close the gap on health disparities, to ensure that we're meeting the needs of health equity of people across the state of Pennsylvania, we're going to need to focus and make sure that we understand those cultures and provide meaningful care, linguistically appropriate care to all of the people that we serve in Pennsylvania. We also understand that we're in a place where we're competing for talent. Like all of you and your organizations, we're all competing for talent. And it's very critical that we're creating a welcoming environment, not only to the people who are from this area, because recruiting locally is very, very important, but also as we're bringing people into Pennsylvania. We're competing for that talent. We want to make sure that they're not only coming to an organization that's inclusive, but also in a community where they feel like they're welcomed and can bring their families and succeed. We know that student enrollment, given the um, COVID, um, given the pandemic and what we've seen over the last two years, there has been an increase in the people of color who are applying and getting accepted into medical schools, into nursing schools. Um, And we know that that's valuable for us. We recognize that the diversity of not only the students, but the, the physicians and the providers that we have at Geisinger, that enables us to provide that quality of care. So it's not only our talent, but it's our students that we're bringing in and training on providing cultural competent care as well. And then community engagement. We recognize that as we continue to expand across the state, we'll need to engage our communities as well. And that's different than what we've done in central and northeastern Pennsylvania. We will be going into communities eastern and western and southern Pennsylvania, and those are different for us. And so we recognize that our business case is to make sure that we're showing up, that we're a part of all of the communities across the state of Pennsylvania. So, but there's some barriers that exist, and I think all of us are familiar with some of the barriers that I'll talk about today. Um, they're geographical barriers, they're institutional barriers, as well as individual barriers. You know, physical location and density of diversity is a barrier that many organizations face depending on where you're located. And we recognize that in central and northeastern Pennsylvania. 
you know, we may see some homogeneous um, communities, right, where we need to think more heterogeneously, you know, diversifying the groups that we live in. And it's our culture. You know, we have a deep-rooted history of our culture in central Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I notice a big difference of the commercials that I see coming from North Carolina and then coming to Pennsylvania. It's different. And I've seen a lot of commercials um, promoting, you know, different politicians that I didn't see in North Carolina. And it's interesting to me. I'm, I'm sitting up, I pick up the phone and say, hey, did you know that this commercial is going on in Pennsylvania? It's curiosity. And it's different. And I think that's very important that we have those different views. And we'll begin to see them as we expand across the state. I think it, from an institutional perspective, we also see the culture. You know, um, we have different religions um, in central Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, we have different um, ways that we do business, right? And so we're seeing that not only in our communities, we're seeing that in our institutions. And so our policies may not be as up to date as they need to be given the diversity of people that we've had coming into organizations. We're also seeing leadership capabilities, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but inclusive leadership, right? How accustomed are we to leading individuals that are from different backgrounds, right? Um, and so that's important. And then that gets into our individual attitudes and our personal biases and prejudices that exist. These are all barriers to creating an inclusive work environment. There are barriers to creating an inclusive community, and we have to think about those things. We haven't had to. Some of us haven't had to think about it, but as an organization like Geisinger, we have to think about those barriers and making sure that we're putting processes, that we're creating inclusive leaders so that we can overcome these barriers, all right? So given this information, the survey, the poll is going to open back up. Um, what are some of the barriers that are most significant for you and your organization? Sorry about that. What are some of the barriers that are most significant for you and your organization? I can sing the Jeopardy music if you'd like. <laughs> Yes. Can we put it up there? Or, do you, or are we all looking at it on our phones? Okay, y'all can tell me then. That's great. Okay, so what are our numbers looking like? Twenty nine percent bias and prejudice. Mm, okay. Is, uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Anyone want to share any thoughts? Yes. I didn't get it. Oh, they didn't get it. Oh, okay. So the options would be the ones that you see up here. So it would be location. Okay. All right. Got it. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Well, let's keep it moving then. I know that we have 15 minutes and I wanted to make sure that we have time for questions. So in this presentation, I have given all of us five ways companies can improve DEI. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one. Um, well, I'll talk about all of them. First one is developing inclusive leaders, developing inclusive cultures, um, deploying and employing the community, or develop and employ the community, address the invisible aspects of DEI, and then attract and invest in minority-owned, women-owned um, businesses in our organization, in our communities. So let's start with the first one, which is um, developing inclusive leaders. So I've always had this vision, um, and I'll tell you why in a second, that we should be developing inclusive leaders from middle school up, from the time that children can begin to think about diversity all the way to retirement, honestly. Um, and I say that because I was in a situation, my, my oldest son, Corey, who is 26 now, um, played lacrosse and hockey growing up in North Carolina. These are two sports that are not too ethnically diverse in nature. Um, 
But I saw the passion in his eyes and I could not tell that young man no. So when Corey was probably about five, I bought him his first set of hockey gear. Um, and I could not pull him off of the ice. And he's still 26, doing all kinds of extreme sports. But there was a game where um, Corey was playing hockey. And we all know hockey, you break out into fights. They break out into fights for, you know, just anything. And I had the habit of always asking Corey, so why were, what was the fight about this time? And half the time he didn't know, but he just liked being in the middle of it and having a good time, right? And so I asked, um, there was one time where there was another brawl, but I noticed Corey, who was probably about 13, 14 at this time, where he was not in the middle of the brawl. He was like on the outside. He was just hanging out, skating around and, you know, not even participating in the fight. And after the game, I asked Corey, I was like, hey, what was that brawl about? And, and I said, and I noticed you weren't in the middle of it. And I was giving him a hard time. I was playing around with him. He was like, yeah, no, that, I, I wasn't going to get involved in that one. I'm like, well, what was the fight about? He's like, one of the other teammates called me the N-word. And I remember looking back, remembering that fight. All of his team members were furious. Every last one of them. And I get emotional telling the story. Because those 13-year-olds were now inclusive leaders. They were now an ally for Corey. They would never let that happen to him again. That's how we build inclusive leaders. We make sure that our children know the importance of being respected, for who they are. And Corey's friends knew that. I don't know if their parents taught them, <laughs> but I hugged them afterwards. <laughs> and so Patty Cakes, his name is Patrick Williams. Patty Cakes till this day is always welcome in my house, right? Because he was one of the main ones. He was like, Miss Kim, no one's going to talk to your son like that. No one will ever do that. Not on my watch with Corey, right? So the value of creating inclusive leaders is that we become allies for each other. And if we can't use our voice for people who don't have a voice, then what good is our voice, right? So it begins with building inclusive leaders. And I believe, and I have this vision, Amy doesn't know yet, but now she knows. Um, my vision is that as a community, we begin to build inclusive leaders from the time our kids can talk. Anyone want to join me on that? <laughs> and that way we begin, it, and I'm being selfish now, it helps our recruiting members. And Julene and I are talking about that, right? We create communities that people want to be a part of. And I think it's just really important that we do that. We formalize training sessions for our youngsters. We formalize training sessions for our retired people who are in the room. And we bring them together to demonstrate what being an inclusive leader is. It helps us create allies with each other. That's not only for people of color, it's for LGBT, it's for transgender individuals. Anyone who's different, we want them to feel welcome and our inclusive leaders are a way to do that. Our inclusive leaders help us build inclusive cultures, right? And our inclusive cultures are where we evaluate our norms, we evaluate our processes. We're evaluating everything to remove the isms, whether it be, you know, homophobism, xenophobism, I mean, all of the isms, sexism, racism, we're gonna remove all of those, right? That's what we do in our culture. But one of the other things that we've done at Guy Singer is we've begun to have inclusive conversations. I like to call, I call it short in my head, inclusions, but I don't know if that would go over very well, but inclusive conversations. And what we've done is we've begun to create scripts for our leaders around how to talk about diversity. You know, 
we just went through one of the slides. What is diversity, equity, and inclusion? What does it mean to you? And you start by having those conversations about just regular things. Let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that when you do have an incident on your team, or when you do have a situation where, hey, we're going to need to dig a little bit deeper into our thoughts and beliefs on this, you now have already established a way to have the conversations on your teams, right? So those inclusive conversations are going to be really important. And oh, by the way, Patty Cakes, Patrick, Patrick Williams, right, already knows how to have these conversations with his peers. He started early, right? And so I think having these conversations, not only in our corporate settings, but in our schools, in our communities, as we're having conferences like this, let's have an inclusive conversation. Now, a lot of my peers know that I'll call a timeout in a meeting really quickly and say, hey, can we stop saying, let's, let's talk about what this word means and let's, you know, think about how it's going to go over, what it means to other people with different backgrounds, right? Yes. Sure. Yeah. She's doing a timeout now. <laughs> Love it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the biases that, and the barriers that come into play, how is that received, not just in our organization, but any organization that you've been in? Well, it depends on the culture, right? This is part of creating that inclusive culture. But I'll give you an example of what we did the most recent time out that I said, well, let's talk about this one. I was in a meeting and we were talking about grandfathering a, a policy or grandfathering something. Um, and we said, and I heard it once, and I said, oh, okay, I'll let it go. We'll keep going. We're in, the, we're in a big meeting. I'm not going to stop the meeting. Someone said it again. I was like, oh, that's twice. I am the diversity leader. <laughs> Should I say something? <laughs> then it was said a third time, and I said, hey, can we do a quick diversity timeout really quickly? I want to just call out something that we're saying. Grandfathered has a deep history in our country, and actually... Um, voting rights for people of color and women were based on grandfather status, right? You could vote if your grandfather could vote. And so that's becoming really sensitive in our culture today. And so I did do a timeout to say, can we find another word other than grandfather because of the connotation and the historical reference as it relates to voting and being free? for slaves. Can we think about something a little bit different? And it was an education opportunity because a lot of people didn't know that. And then secondly, we're like, yeah, you know what? That's a good point. I didn't recognize that that's what was happening. And so we spent a little time talking about what other word could we use? So other options were, I think, what were the other options? Legacy. Legacy also has a different connotation. <laughs> exactly. And so it gave us an opportunity to have a conversation. I'm not going to say you're going to come up with a solution every time, but what it does do is it opens up the conversation. Great question, Stacy. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, let's see. We talked about inclusive cultures. Now let's talk about um, developing and employing the community. Uh, here is where... I know Julene and I talk a lot about our recruiting strategy, and I think it's very important that we not only develop our leaders from the inside out, but we're also bringing them in from the outside in. And I think it's important that we're focused on our local communities and making sure that we have education programs. We're partnering with, with um, community-based organizations to develop skills of people who ordinarily wouldn't have the opportunity to work at a Geisinger or any other organization in their communities. And so it really is an opportunity for us to develop our community. I also think that we need to recognize that through the pandemic, 3.7 women have exited the workforce. 3.7. And I think we all know that it's, you know, several reasons focused on work-life integration, 
which is what Janet just talked about, um, work-life balance, having to make a tough decision on whether or not we take care of our kids because many schools, daycares were closed and we had to make tough decisions. Those women are still around and there's an opportunity for us to think about how we employ differently. We think about working from home being an option. Hybrid working is also an option. Are we splitting jobs? Do people not want to come back to work full time? Can we do part time more than we're doing full time or in addition to full time, right? So companies are having to think differently about how we employ the workforce that exists today. I also want to make sure that we're calling out people with disabilities. And I'll share a story with you of an individual that I took a risk on. And I'm not going to say take a risk because she was the greatest, one of the greatest employees that I, I've had in my career. But I, I was um, introduced to an organization. It's an ARC organization. We have one in central Pennsylvania. Um, and they asked if I had a need for an administrative assistant. And I was like, yes, I do. This is when I was with the AICPA. I, I have, yes, <laughs> I have lots of needs for an administrative assistant. Um, but they said, She's autistic, though. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's fine. Um, so Bridget and I um, began to build our relationship through a contract. She was in a temporary role with ARC. Um, I quickly identified that Bridget was a data master, and she could find anything on Google, right? I, she, that was her jam. And if I were to give Bridget an assignment around pulling this data together or to do any research on Google, as long as she had her space, she could do her thing. Now, the only thing about Bridget is that she had a need to have a lot of stuff on her desk to protect her and her thinking from other people. So when we were in the office, people would be like, oh my gosh, Bridget's, you know, strange. She has all of these things around her to keep her focused. Or they just thought she was cluttered. She was cluttering herself. I understood that she needed this to keep her focus. So for the first year, I really protected Bridget. Yeah, I wouldn't let anyone go directly to Bridget um, because I wanted her to maintain her focus. I was protecting her as a person with a different need, and I was doing the wrong thing by sheltering her from the rest of the organization. So after thinking about this and recognizing, wow, I'm doing her a disservice, people really don't know how amazing she is by protecting her the way that I was. So I began having conversations about Bridget, with Bridget's permission, talking about her different ability. And then people began to see how much of a genius she was in her data analytics and in her research, right? So Bridget then became one of the people that would always come up when we needed research or you know, any type of data integration or data analysis. And so this is where we can change our own thinking. Here I was trying to protect Bridget, not giving her the opportunity to be exposed to the rest of the organization, educating the organization on her talents and skills, but also educating my peers on what we needed to do to make sure she was successful. That's equity, right? She needed that to be successful. So I think as we think about our communities, we need to think fully about the skills, the depth and breadth of skills that exist in our community so that we can give back to the economic sustainability of those that we serve, right? So that's really the importance of making sure that we're developing and employing the community. And also providing, the last bullet there is providing mentorship in that pipeline. And this brings me to the other um, piece of diversity, which is partly what I just talked about, addressing the invisible um, aspects of DE&I. And so that's the things that we didn't see about Bridget. But what I think is also very important is that we protect the mental and physical health of our employees. I think that's really important. Um, we are seeing in the news today and in a lot of research how the mental impact of COVID is 
very, very common and prominent in a lot of our employees. And so as we think about how we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's going to be really important that we provide resources, that we provide um, you know, tools and space for employees to be themselves and to work through their mental and physical health. And that's through policies, that's through procedures that may have unintentional bias in them that we might want to consider as well. And then last but not least, I do want us to make sure that we're focused on minority-owned businesses, um, women-owned businesses, small businesses, veteran-owned, disability-owned businesses. Um, I love the market that we had out there today, but... I'm looking for the diverse suppliers. I'm looking for the LGBTQ suppliers. And so we have a wonderful opportunity and we have lots of businesses that I know my teammates and I have just become aware of right in the Scranton area that we do need to make sure that we're employing as um, company leaders as well as community leaders. All right, I'm looking at my time and I'm gonna go through the last slide. So, what are some mistakes that we make when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion? The first one is tokenism, right? You know, well intended, but I know that, you know, there are times where we're like, we've got to get a woman into this role. We've got to get a person of color into this role. And what we want to do is avoid tokenism because that sends, um, that, that's not good for the person coming into the role. Nor the, or nor the people watching it unfold, right? Making sure that we're very intentional about building the talent internally and strategically placing people in roles, not just doing one person to make a statement, right? And I think that, that's, um, that happens and, and we try to make it not happen, but sometimes it does, but we don't wanna make that mistake. Um, we also wanna, don't wanna use um, DEI as a marketing tool. So, you know, we're looking at our website. We don't have any brown people on our website or we don't have any people with disabilities on our website. You want to make sure it's genuine, right? So you do want to put it out there, but you also want to make sure that it's valued if the person were to come into the organization. So whatever you're putting on your marketing materials, make sure it translates to how your culture actually behaves. Um, the next item, oh, sorry, the next item is around overcome, um, don't overcommit to isolated DEI training. So all of us need unconscious bias training. We need microaggressions training, diversity training. We all need the training. But one of the things that you heard me talk about today was the conversation. Action, things change when you have a conversation. When you're sitting in a room for four hours talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you walk out the room, and that's the last conversation you have about it, that's not what diversity, equity, and inclusion is about. It's about a conversation. It's about a movement. It's how we change the way that we work. And that only happens when we have consistent education. Last but not least, the mistake that we make is not asking questions, not being curious about other people's diversity and making assumptions about what other people need. So if you want to put into place a program for people with neurodiversity, ask the people with neurodiversity, right? If you want to put in a program for mothers and lactation, ask mothers who are in that experience right now. So making sure we're asking questions of the people who are going to be impacted. And last but not least, some guiding principles. Um, research your DE&I and related issues for your company. So here is where it's about you. It's about your organization, understanding your data, establishing your business case. One size does not fit all. So it's really important that each organization take the time to understand what your issues are. What's your data looking like? What is your business case? And then making sure that you're setting measurable goals and maintaining accountability and leading with empathy and clear messaging. And I'll close with this. One size does not fit all, but inclusion does begin with I. Inclusion begins with each one of us evaluating where we stand and how we feel about different cultures, different people, and our own biases in order for us to make a change and grow in this space. 
So that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And I am going to close. <laughs> all right.